wearables to track patient health. So I, I, I've been like super excited to talk about this all week. And that's because we've always like kind of hinted to this. Like we've, we've had parallel conversations when discussing other stuff, but we really, I don't think ever done uh, patient health tracking. We did the digital twin models and how like it could mm -hmm. one day be used with wearables, but never directly talked about the topic. So yeah, well, this is one, one very, very important cog in that machine we've talked about, right? Exactly. So let's, let's get right into it. Um, it's coming out of the Washington University at St. Louis, and Professor Chen Yang Lu is spearheading these efforts. But what I love about it, like most topics I love, it's not just one team in one discipline. Professor Chen Yang Lu is, is more on the engineering side, but he works with other, you know, like medical doctors to make sure that the stuff that they're developing actually works and then they do trials. So as we kind of hinted at in the in the ad with Mauser and what you just said, there's a big problem in having patients walk out of the hospital and you not knowing what's happening to them, right? Is the treatment working? Is it not working? And right now, I feel like most of the people's perception of these wearable technologies is like, oh, look, like I did my 10,000 steps today, yeah. or this is what my heart rate is. But I, I'm very bullish on the future where we're all wearing some of these devices and not only can we make sure that the treatments we're getting at the doctor's office is working, but understanding how our body's changing on a minute to minute basis so that if something's wrong, we can detect it right away instead of at the yearly checkup. So that's kind of what they're trying to address here. And the question is, can we do this with consumer grade wearables? Okay, so like trying to cut the line between the Fitbit that I get off the shelf, yes. the Apple Watch that I'm wearing, is that going to give them enough data or the right data to do diagnosis like they would if they had me hooked up to some sensors in the doctor's office? Exactly. Because that, that, like a Fitbit is telling the doctors about the steps you're taking, your heart rate, your sleep cycles, and can they extract meaningful medical data that is relevant to you from what's coming to them, like what's, okay. what, what the device is uploading? The answer is yes with an asterisk, asterisk mark. Um, so let's talk about... I see that in your notes. Yes. yes with an asterisk. That I, I specifically did it just, just so I could say it out loud. Um, but what, what is the problem here? And um, Professor Liu broke it down into two bits. One was noisy data and two. the second one was lossy data. So noisy data is corrupted or inconsistent data that's coming from these devices where the machine is going to have a difficult time understanding a pattern because of the noise. So there has to be some work to... Um, not guess, but make an educated guess of what is actually happening, what okay. the actual data is. So and there's some like machine learning algorithm algorithm or something like that to sort out the, the signal from the noise. And you said the other half is uh, lossy data. Yes, you're picking up what I'm putting down. Uh, lossy data is when this is probably pretty common. I don't have a wearable, but maybe you can speak to this. The battery dies, or you have to recharge it, or you know you have to take it off. It's just bothering you. So there's My these Apple like watch gaps. My watch is dead right now. So yeah, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> you came ready for this episode. Yeah. Um, but yeah, those gaps in data is not ideal when you want to track and get a full picture of what's going on. So that can lead to inaccuracy if they want to, you know, extrapolate information that is supposed to be uh, vital to your health. That's those are the big concerns. So what is the secret sauce here? Um, I would do a drum roll, but let's just get into it. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> the machine learning model that you hinted at, again, always picking up what I'm putting down. And this machine learning model has been fine-tuned, and this is the thing that Professor Liu has been spearheading. Um, it's, it's very touchy. It needs to work with a lot of different parameters, but they've been working with Fitbits, and they can actually extract that relevant medical information to tell them how a patient's behaving. What so, are the like main things that they're looking for when you say like relevant medical information? What are the, I don't know, KPIs aren't the right way to say it, key performance indicators, but what are the key health indicators that they're able to extract from this data and what does that tell them about the patient? I don't know specifically what they're looking for, but the raw data they're getting is what the device has available for everyone. So for Fitbit, it's the, you know, the steps, the heart, and then the sleep cycle. But I think but one of the things they hinted at is that they need to build a patient profile that is connecting their background and medical history to the data that we're looking for. Okay. So I think that changes 
based on the patient themselves. That makes sense. So the parameters that you care about is probably going to be different when looking at healthy 23-year-old Daniel versus, you know, someone that has just had heart surgery at the age of 65 yeah, and they've had this condition for so many years. You'll take baseline measurements in the doctor's office with that, ex, you know, ex, extremely calibrated, uh, you know, medical grade equipment. And the Fitbit does a great job of filling in the gaps in between so that, you know, get little blips to, to measure how the patient's doing in the meantime. Or uh, this is perfect segue to my, uh, w- what they're doing with it right now. So um, one of the ways they've been trying to prove this out is with clinical trials. And one of the ones they did, did it with was pancreatic surgery. So they took 48 patients, gave them Fitbits, and for one month before the surgery, they monitored all that data. So all the me- data that they were getting from the Fitbit. And then they had the surgery, and then they started monitoring again the data after the surgery. So instead of using the the sophisticated equipment at the doctor's office, they're still using the Fitbit, which cool. the, is the even part better. that I was like, even better, right? Even better. And well, what does this mean? Is it good? Did it work? Well, yeah. 20 out of the 48 patients actually had complications after the surgery, and they had to be readmitted to the hospital. And... I don't know if you knew this, but apparently there's this thing called the American College of Surgeons National Surgical Quality Risk Calculator, which is how surgeons determine the risk of a procedure for a patient. Okay, so, so they decide whether it's worth it or not to yeah. do the procedure or what complications you might have afterward based on using this risk calculator? Yeah, so that that's, I think, in movies when they're like, there's a 30% chance of like uh, survival or something. I think this is what it's based on. Okay. And so they compared what this machine learning algorithm was telling them about patients that would have complications versus the risk uh, factor that this process was telling them. And the machine learning model significantly outperformed this risk analysis that I think is like used across the board for all surgical procedures. Just collecting Fitbit data and combining that with a little bit of patient history, doing machine Mm -hmm. learning to predict the outcome, that outperformed the industry standard in terms of telling us what the risk is significantly outperformed and they didn't give the data on what significant was but i'm going to trust them on here because this sounds pretty impressive that that opens my mind to the the world of possibilities here where everyone has a consumer grade wearable accessible to them or most people do um imagine yes if yes in general, you could use this to calculate the risk of any procedure ahead of time or to understand the complications that you might encounter um, and how to monitor, like we talked about with the Mauser article, your recovery after and maybe the preparation that you're taking up before the surgery. I mean, all of this, I mean, you can tell my mind's spinning right now. I'm just spitting stuff out. But I'm with you. I'm it, with you. It, uh, t- to me, this seems pretty pretty groundbreaking. Dude, and like when... The Apple Watch first came out, I I was one of those people that was like, why? Like, who actually cares that much about, like, your steps or whatever? And I didn't see the value in it. And honestly, to this day, I still don't see a lot of value in it. But this, if I could get my health data monitored to the point where, like, you can almost tell that I'm having problems before I even know it, and then I can have that check-in, that's awesome. And slight tangent, I don't know if you know this, I was, I think I was listening to this in a, in a podcast. The reason Apple invested in the Apple Watch was because of Steve Jobs. Apparently when, he, you know, he was having his issues with cancer, he was like, why isn't there a better way of doing health monitoring? And I think that that's when he came up with the idea of the Apple Watch. And that's what the Apple Watch is evolving to be, is this health solution yeah. that knows you, knows your health and works with doctors better than anything out there. Well, I was going to say, I thought it was pretty gimmicky as well. I actually didn't even buy my Apple Watch. I won it in a giveaway. So like, no I, I was like, I would never buy this thing. But now trying to, you know, keep my body in shape and exercise and see how my health is doing without it seems crazy. Um, just as you guys can probably guess, I'm pretty data driven in my decision making and looking at results of things. Um, given my engineering background and my love for mathematics, without having the data from the Apple Watch, I would feel lost. Like, I don't know, like wandering around in the woods, you have a map, but no compass. So you don't know which direction you're headed. Um, You have general landmarks of, you know, what's good for your health, but no idea of where you are exactly and which direction you're headed. That's what the Apple Watch and the data provides to me. And it gives, I don't know if it's confirmation bias here, but I'm glad that this um, study lends some credence to the data that it's collecting to say that it actually is relatively useful and it is meaningful in the medical field as well as you know just giving me something to smile about when i see that i filled my exercise goal for the day and do the covering 
articles like this and having these discussions is kind of what sold me on getting a wearable that tracks my health. And I'm pretty excited about it. But I want to wrap up this article really quickly. Uh, I know we're running a little uh, high on time. So what, what does the future look like for this team? And they want to do more clinical trials. They're doing clinical trials to track heart failure patients after discharge. So Mao's article, they were right. They had the, the, the glass ball and they were yeah. seeing into the future. It's happening. And then there was uh, avoiding pulmonary complications after abdominal surgery. So another um, set of patients before and after analysis. But there's still challenges to overcome. They need a bigger cohort of patients to fine tune this model. So with most machine learning models, having a large data set is great. Right now, because these are clinical trials, they've only been working with a few dozen patients at a time, which isn't that great. And then the infrastructure needed to actually link that medical data to the data that's being transmitted by these devices, like having some sort of you know standard that puts these two together and links them up instead of it yeah. being a one-off thing. I've worked in the medical technology space before, um, and the tricky part about that is not actually transferring the data or storing it in one place it's doing it securely because patient data there's a lot of exactly. regulations around it and for good reason right no one wants their personal Absolutely. data about their health being leaked out anywhere so that's probably their biggest challenge right is making sure that they're complying with all the regulations around making sure that personal data is treated the way that it should which is very 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 carefully absolutely mm -hmm.